Horses, Life and Times The Latin poet Quintus Horatius Flaccus, known to English speakers as Horace, was born on 8 December 65 BCE in the town of Venusia, located in the border area between the southern Italian regions of Apulia and Lucania. He died on the 27th of November 8 BCE in the city of Rome. He and Virgil are the best-known Latin poets from the second half of the first century BCE. Our knowledge of Horace comes primarily from two sources. The first is Horace's own writings. These, of course, due to the circular nature of self-reference, like those of any writer, need to be used with caution as a source on their own author. The second is a short biography of him, which has come down to us in the history of literary transmission, along with some of the manuscripts of his writings. This biography is probably a version of the life of Horace, written by the biographer Suetonius, born circa 69 CE, for De Poetis, concerning poets. A section of his work, De Viris Illustribus, concerning illustrious men, and his collection of lives of Roman literary figures. Horace's name itself is preserved for us in his own writings, as well as in an inscription that still exists, which records Horace's composition of a poem known in Latin as the Carmen Saeculare, or Centennial Hymn. This poem was commissioned especially for the secular games of 17 BCE held by the Emperor Augustus. These games were a Roman celebration marking the end of one age, or seculum, and the beginning of the next. They had not been held at Rome for over a century. It would have been a great honor to Horace to have been the poet asked to write for this occasion. The hymn was performed by a chorus of boys and girls, first at the newly built Temple of Apollo on the Palatine Hill, and then on the Capitoline Hill, or Capitolium, the religious center of Rome. It featured many figures important to Rome, including Apollo, the god with whom Augustus closely associated himself. The century in which Horace lived and died saw the end of the Roman Republic and the beginning of the Roman Empire. The Emperor Augustus, called Octavian before receiving this honorific title from the Roman Senate in 27 BCE, emerged as the dominant political figure in Horace's lifetime and brought to an end a long period of civil war among the Romans. His rule also brought to an end the Republican form of government, whose power lay in the Senate, the consuls, and the assemblies and ushered in what we now call the Roman Empire, a government that was based primarily on the rule of one individual. Horace's life and work were deeply influenced by the times in which he lived. In his later life, Horace became close to the political and intellectual elite of Rome, but he did not start out as part of that milieu. Horace was born the son of a freedman, or ex-slave. His father worked as a co-factor Argentarius, or auction agent. We do not know anything about his mother. Horace's father may have become enslaved during the so-called Social Wars, 91 to 87 BCE, or wars with the Allies in which Horace's birthplace, the town of Venusia, which had a lesser version of citizenship called Latin Rites, was taken by the Romans. When the fighting ended, Venusia was granted full Roman citizenship. Social status was very significant among the Romans, and the distinction between slave and free was a fundamental one. Horace's lower status as the son of a freedman may have made his rise to importance within Roman society somewhat more difficult. Roman society had a certain amount of social fluidity, but one's status always mattered. Finances and social status, though, did not have the automatic correlation one might expect. Despite issues of status, Horace's father was wealthy enough to educate his son along with sons of the Roman elite providing him with an education that was typical for those from families of the equestrian and senatorial classes. Among free people, three classes were distinguished. Senatorial, the very wealthy who had political careers in the Senate, equestrian, the wealthy non-senatorial class, and last, the common people. Former slaves ranked below the common people in social status, even though they might have wealth. Horace's father brought him from his home in Venusia to the city of Rome for his early education. In Rome, Horace studied, among other authors, the early Latin writer Livius Andronicus, as well as the great Greek poet Homer. He, along with other prosperous young Roman men, continued his education at an advanced level by studying philosophy at Athens, a standard place for the final stage of education. Another student at Athens during Horace's time, there was the son of Marcus Tullius Cicero, 
the famous orator and politician. The first century BCE had seen a lot of political upheaval in Rome. The formation of the first triumvirate, the alliance of Pompey, Julius Caesar, and Crassus in 60 BCE challenged the rule of the Senate and showed that leaders backed by armed force and members of non-senatorial classes could not be ignored. However, the alliance did not last. Crassus died. Pompey became more tied to the Senate. There were constitutional irregularities on Caesar's part and on Pompey's. The showdown came when Caesar crossed the Rubicon River in 49 BCE, which signaled his defy ants of Roman law, for he was illegally leading his army across the border of the province he commanded. Thus, by the time Horus was in his teens, the former allies, Pompey and Caesar, had become engaged in a civil war. The next year, Caesar defeated Pompey at the Battle of Pharsalus and went on to rule Rome until his assassination. After Julius Caesar's death in 44 BCE, fighting broke out between the liberators, or tyrannicides, depending on the political perspective concerning Caesar's removal. Led by Brutus and Cassius and the heirs to Caesar's power, Octavian and Mark Antony. About six months after Caesar's death, Brutus came to Athens looking for men to recruit for his side. Horus, like Cicero's son, joined the cause of those trying to keep the Republic alive. During his service in Brutus's army, Horus was appointed to the rank of military tribune, or tribunus militum. This rank, which conferred equestrian status upon its holder, was normally reserved for those men headed for a political career in the Senate. It was not typical for the son of a freedman, like Horus, to hold this particular rank, and Horus reports being taunted about it showing that certain privileges of class were jealously guarded. Despite the somewhat unusual appointment in terms of his social status, it is likely from what we know that Horace had already met the financial requirements for being an equestrian even before this military appointment. Once again, despite his social circumstances, Horace managed to follow a path that was more typical for those coming from elite families. His prospects changed though, in some ways after the Battle of Philippi in 42 BCE, where Mark Antony and Octavian defeated the Republican forces in which he was included. In the aftermath of Philippi, much land in Italy was confiscated for Octavian's victorious soldiers. When Horace returned to Italy, pardoned by the victors, he found himself without his paternal home and estate. At this point, Horace writes that poverty drove him to write, we should not take this at face value because, as we will see, he was not actually poor. What his statement likely entails is an indirect comment upon his changed political fortune, as well as his loss of property. These factors may have helped him choose to start along the path towards becoming a professional poet. We know that he was not poor because he was still able to purchase for himself the job of Scriba Questorius, clerk to the questors, officials in charge of the public treasury. This position involved work with public finance as well as with the public records. It was an important job requiring both intelligence and knowledge. The position was held for life. Its great value for Horace was that it provided him with a continuous income, while only intermittently demanding a great deal of his time. For a poet who wanted to be able to write, this was an ideal position. It is unlikely that Horace ever expected to be supported by his writing. By the early 30s BCE, not long after Philippi, Horace likely was sharing his writing with others. He became friends with the famous poet Virgil, as well as the now lesser-known poet Varius. These two introduced Horace to Gaius Silnius Macinus, a very wealthy man of equestrian rank, whose family had originally come from Etruria, north of Rome. Nine months after this introduction, Macinus invited Horace to become part of his circle of friends, an event that would prove central to Horace's life and work. Macinus served as an important advisor to Octavian until the late 20s BCE, and his circle included many important poets. Thus, through his friendship with Macinus, Horace became connected with the intellectual and political elite of his day. After Philippi, Antony and Octavian held power together, but not for long. Their conflict escalated into another civil war. Antony joined forces with Cleopatra, queen of Egypt. Octavian's forces defeated them at the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE. Their subsequent suicides left Octavian's power secure. Peace under Augustus came at a price. Civil war was finally over, but rule by a single leader was definitively established. Both involvement with and a somewhat detached perspective on the new Augustan order 
characterized Horace's life and poetry. Although connected to those with influence and power, like Augustus and Messinus, Horace managed to maintain a certain distance. As noted above, he accepted Augustus's commission to write the Carmen Seculare, yet he turned down a request by Augustus to serve as his personal secretary. This position would have involved helping the busy Augustus with his extensive correspondence. Horace claimed ill health, but this appears to have been just an excuse. Augustus did not hold this refusal against him, and their relationship remained cordial. It is interesting to see that a man who did not start life as part of the Roman elite, and who had not always sided with the winning faction, managed to become so prominent and well-regarded as a poet that he was invited to compose a poem for a state occasion. Did he become a court poet, or did he maintain his independence? Like his friend and fellow poet Virgil, Horace recognized and celebrated some of the positive changes that Augustus brought to Rome while, in my opinion and in that of many other scholars, maintaining a certain wariness about the price of that peace. That a somewhat ambiguous embrace of the Augustan age was possible under Augustus may suggest that poetry, for a time, could hold on to a certain kind of independent authority. Shortly after the time of Virgil and Horace, the poet Ovid was exiled by Augustus. For Horace and Virgil, though, Rome managed briefly to be a cause for celebration, but also for sober reflection. Whether in Virgil's work or in Horace's, one hears the voice of a generation that experienced civil war and its losses and wondered about the fate of a society that would become dependent on a single man's rule. Just as Horace started O Hue Carnot socially as something of an outsider, as a mature poet, he tried to maintain a kind of independence, keeping a voice that, through poetry, attempted to encompass even the authority of the state. By celebrating Rome, Horace became larger than Rome,